The heart of the Catholic faith is expressed in the Creed. Both the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed begin with God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. In this session, we'll focus on the first person of the Blessed Trinity, who creates the world in majesty, yet comes to us in tenderness, inviting us to an intimate relationship with Himself. So we're here before the iconic Trevi Fountain, probably one of the most well-known, well-visited places in all of Rome. It's so beautiful and so powerful with the water and the tritons and the different Greek and Roman deities. But why would we start here to talk about our session on God? It's kind of strange because these deities aren't real and we're talking about the true living God here. Yes. But the thing you got to know about the living God is that we can never completely understand him because our minds are limited, he's in unlimited, infinite, right? Yeah. So he's not like a crossword puzzle we can solve and be done with. Yeah. He, we can only approach him through signs and symbols that he's revealed in scripture to give us some insight into who he is. And one of the main images in scripture for God is water, living water, the source of life. God is a sea of peace, he's an ocean of mercy. And that's why this is such a great backdrop for this session. Yes. You're so right, Marcelino. I mean, water symbolizes life. It's also power. Uh, and this is the true and living God is transcendent, almighty creator, but he's also near. He comes close to us. He's imminent. Much of philosophy, man's innate religiosity is yearning for God, searching for God. Right. But revelation, God's revelation to us in scripture, in right. Jesus Christ, that's God's search for us. Yeah. That's God looking for us, oh, revealing his heart, his plans, his inner life his love, and that's something that man's innate reason, religiosity, yearning, could never come to. God opens up himself, comes down to us to lift us up to him, and this gives the rhyme and the reason for our entire story, where we came from, who we are, and where we're going. The creed is not like a political platform, a collection of positions that form an ideology. No, our creed is about a God who is personal and who has a plan for all of creation and for each of us, his beloved creatures. A lot of this series that we're doing is about what we believe. And it's important here to make this really clear point our, the content of our faith isn't so much a what, it's a who. It's personal. We believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God, one in three, and God's amazing plan of salvation for us. Right, and I think so many times it's hard because we sometimes think of God as so distant. Yeah. He's so like out there, not kind of disinterested in me and what's yeah. going on in my life. But we like, see it time and time again in the scriptures, he's called Father. It's, yep. Sometimes it's even called like Abba, which is like Papa or Daddy. And it can be hard for us to kind of see how, how much he wants to be interested in what we're doing in our lives, that we kind of forget that he is that community of persons that's inviting us in like a father would, who is so interested in us, who created us unique and unrepeatable, irreplaceable. That's the father we're talking about. Absolutely. And you know, this idea of irreplaceability, that's what person really means. A person is irreplaceable. And that really helps us understand, too, that God is not only personal, but God is interpersonal. From all eternity, God has been relational. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three irreducibly 
individual persons with right. one nature, one God, right. and we're made in that image and likeness. It's crazy that so many people don't realize that God is personal. They think, you know, the force be with you, that God's like an impersonal force. Exactly. Or, yes. or they think that he's really distant and you can't have a personal relationship. Right. Why would he care about my life and my little problems, you know? Right, right. But, but the reality is God's not only personal, he's more personal than we are. Yes. He is three persons eternally giving one, themselves in love to one another without beginning, without end. And we're invited into that relationship. In fact, we're made in the image of that triune exactly. communal relationship. To say that we're in the image of God doesn't just mean intellect and will. It means we're called to communion, yeah. to an intimate personal relationship, not only with the Trinity, but with one another. Well, and what's neat about the thinking of the Trinity that way is like he wants to bring us into that embrace, yes. like almost like a dad. He wants to like pull you into that embrace and not only bring you there to heal you, but to transform you and to give you what you need as a good father would. And I think that sometimes we get lost on, I gotta be this, I gotta do this to like make my dad proud. Yes. That's not how it is. He says, come to me in your mess, come to me in your brokenness, and I'm the dad that you can lay your head on my shoulder and I just want your heart. Yes. Like I want your heart and I wanna give you my heart. In creation story, he looked at everything that was created and said, that's good. But then when man and woman were created, he said, that's very good. Yeah. And I think that's the way God looks at us as father. He sees the junk, sure, but he looks at the beauty that he has placed in us. He sees his own image in us, and he says, you are good. I love you. And, and I think that's affirming. That puts us on firm ground. All the insecurity in the world would take a big hit if yes. people would discover the love of the father. Throughout human history, the evil we find in our world has caused some to believe that the material world is bad, that salvation means escaping from the body and all physical things to a realm of pure spirit. Scripture has always rejected this view, teaching instead that God is the creator of the material world and that all that he has made is good. Andrew, being here at St. Paul's outside the walls is kind of cool to talk about creation. Paul, just in the letter of Romans, just shows how much of a sense he has of the goodness and the beauty of God's creation. At the beginning, or near the beginning, he talks about natural law, the fact that creation shows us God's will, and everybody ought to be able to read that to some degree. And then he says in Romans 8 that all creation is an eager longing. It groans awaiting the revelation of the sons of God when Jesus comes back. So even creation is going to participate in the new heavens and the new earth. So. Right, right. Too often I think Christians think that heaven is this disembodied soul bliss, whereas we believe in the new heavens, the new earth, the new creation. I just love this topic because I think so many times there's so much confusion about it and creation is so fundamental yeah. to everything that we believe. You know, that God creates in Genesis 1, from nothing, from right. nothing, not from pre-existing stuff or not from, you know, we, we've talked about the other various myths from ancient Near East where creation's often from some, uh, you know, deceased carcass of a dead God and where Genesis 1, God speaks and things come to be. And here's the thing, with creation from nothing, that means creation's not just way back when, not 13.8 billion years ago, you know, lit the fuse of the Big Bang, but the creation is ongoing right now that if God stopped thinking about me for a moment, I wouldn't die, I'd vanish. That's really important. I don't think people think that way very often. I think they think God got the ball rolling right. and everything's just kind of going along on its own. Right. But honestly, creation is a canvas and God is the divine artist, but he's still painting. And, and the thing is, we're his masterpieces, you know, and he's, he's continuing to craft us. And the beautiful thing is, we don't make ourselves, but he allows us to participate in his creative work. Certainly as parents, those of us who are called to be parents, but all of us, we, we make decisions that further God's creative work in ourselves, in creation. We're stewards of creation. We help develop it. I mean, that's an amazing privilege, it seems to me. It's amazing. And you're right that, that <clears throat> humanity is, is sort of the crown of creation, the, the, the masterpiece. But all of creation is constantly, at every single moment that it exists, concurrently being held in existence by the Almighty God. Every single thing in creation, every perfection really tells us something about a perfection that pre-exists in God himself. And that gives us a great wonder. Like for a Christian who believes in a creator, 
I'm not the owner of creation, I'm the steward. It's a gift of God. I've got, frankly, better reasons to care about the environment than the atheist does. Absolutely. They might care deeply, but we have great reasons to care. Believe in a creator is really to say there's an objective order. Right. It's given, and it's my job to conform to it, right. not shape it according to my whims and desires. Right. We don't impose our ideas on creation. We look for God's ideas embedded in creation. And we work with and them. And we work with them, yeah. absolutely. And the beautiful thing about Laudato Si is, some people don't really get this, but Pope Francis is trying to help us to see that creation proclaims the glory of God. That's what the Psalms say. And you know, I think for me personally, the Psalms, I pray daily in the liturgy, the hours, and especially the Psalms in the morning are all about praise for creation. Right. And they really help me daily. Does that mean creation's creation is good? It's absolutely good. And that's one of the things that's a hallmark of Catholic faith is creation so, so good that the Lord came and entered into creation. The right. word became flesh, visible with a created human nature. And he comes to us now through elements from his creation, the sacraments. So this is part of the incarnate, you know, the incarnational Catholic faith sacramental really goes back to the goodness of creation. The body's good, sex is good, pleasure in its right context is good. As you said, the incarnation, the sacraments, God loves matter. The goodness of created things and the pleasure that comes from enjoying them, that's God's idea. Satan can't create one ounce of goodness, beauty, or pleasure. All he can do is try to twist and pervert right. and just use them to distract us from the creator. It's almost like a parasite that has to exist on a host, right? I mean, God's good order is the fundamental reality. All the devil can do, as you said, is to twist and distort. He can't create. He has to piggyback on what's already there, and that's God's good fundamental order. And what that means is good always wins in the end. All things created by God are good. But man and woman, the pinnacle of his created work, God pronounces to be very good. Human beings are not just one species among many. Instead, the human race is unique. We are God's creative masterpiece because human beings alone are made in the very image and likeness of God. So Sarah, we've been talking about creation and we read through Genesis 1, God creates all these things and, and he pronounces them good. Yeah. But after he creates humanity, uh, Genesis 1.31 says, and everything is very good, tov ma'od, and, and, and only human beings are created in the image and likeness of God. As Vatican II says, only uh, mankind is created for its own sake, for uh, an eternal relationship okay. with the Almighty. And what that means in many different ways, that there's a dignity to human beings. There's an inviolable dignity that can't be taken away, no matter uh, whether in the womb, no matter at the last point just before death, no matter if one's on death row or anything in between, uh, that human life, human dignity, yeah. Uh, has an inherent dignity that cannot be taken away. One of my favorite things about being Catholic is the ardent defense of the human person from mm. womb to tomb. I mean, every time I see someone stand up for the helpless, I just think like, that's what I want to be about. And in our world, there's so much navel gazing. You know, just everyone's just so caught on themselves, like thinking about themselves. But there's a joy that comes from serving the helpless mm. that you just, it's almost you know, hard to explain, but when you see people who are in deep need and being able to answer to that, something inside of us, that joy, that, that love that grows in us for humanity, even people we don't know. Um, I know one of the greatest gifts in my life was my dad, he founded a home for um, people who are afflicted with physical or mental disabilities um, and handicaps. And so from the day I was born, I mean, he's been doing it for 40 years, um, I was raised around people who were in some type of helpless you know, struggling with different types of ailments, maybe not able to even communicate. Um, and they were from all different races. They were, you know, Hispanic and African-American and Asian and Caucasian. And I just grew up around this like beautiful display of humanity that made me as a human being so much more compassionate for those who are struggling and mm -hmm. suffering. And I think about all the great saints that just set out to serve humanity and like the most helpless, you know, like so many of them, all of them laid down their lives for people. And it's really beautiful to see some of those saints that really went into the streets, you know, you, like St. Damien, the leper who yeah. went to the leper colony and served the people who nobody would even, you know, 
go out on the boat to see. You have, I mean, one of our best examples is always gonna be St. Teresa of Calcutta and her missionaries of charity and the way that she would just go into the streets not asking anything ever for herself. Mm. It was all about serving the helpless. And I just love, you know, if you ever visit a missionary of charity, you know, convent, you'll see the beautiful crucifix and every crucifix has this beautiful phrase right next to Jesus, you know, right up by next to his face, it says, I thirst. And it's that daily reminder to the sisters that people thirst and it's not always just for water or food, but a lot of times it's for companionship. It's for yeah. being seen, being known, being loved. And I mean, who doesn't in our society need to be seen and known and loved? And so whether it's being fed physically, being fed spiritually, being fed emotionally, I mean, we really are called as a church, as a part of humanity to serve one another in that way, especially those who are most vulnerable among us. You're so right. And this is so beautiful because you know what it means to believe in a creator? It means life ain't about me. Yeah. It ain't about me. It's about gift. And when we're made in the image and likeness of God, who is Trinitarian, who's a communion of persons, an eternal communion of love. God is love. And what that means is we're made for gift. We'll be fulfilled by gift, not grasping and taking and self-assertion, but making a gift of our lives in love. Pope Francis has talked about the throwaway culture. Well, you know, those on the margins, those who don't produce economically, those who aren't powerful, they just, just cast them away. Right. And he, whether, it's, whether it's abortion, whether it's the elderly, whether it's the, the mentally handicapped, the disabled, to just kind of push them aside and, and throw them away. And John Paul II famously used the language of the culture of death. And he said, what it is fundamentally is a war of the powerful against the weak. And you're exactly right. That is so contrary to what the gospel is all about. Uh, and you start to see this in Genesis. This is what it means to be human. Uh, and you know who lives out the human vocation perfectly and quintessentially? Our Lord. Is our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Our Greater Lord. love has no man than he would lay his life down for his friends. And that's what the cross is. That's what Jesus does. And you know, there's a line from Hebrews 5, 8, where it says that, uh, that Christ, though he was a son, he became perfect through suffering. And you might think of it this way, that God is love. God is this eternal community of persons, but when that kind of love takes on finite flesh right. in a fallen world, mm. it looks like the cross. Mm. And that's what we're called to, is to make a gift of our lives in love, uh, especially to those who are on the margins, who are mm -hmm. the weakest among us. Yeah. Uh, so I just love the witness of your dad and your family, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and I can see it in you that what you say is just, it's so authentic and so real because this formed you, it shaped you. Absolutely. To be around people who couldn't do anything for you, yeah. but you could serve them, not just in their bodies, but in their souls, their hearts, their minds, to treat them as, as persons. And that's what it's all about. God brought order out of chaos and created the world to be a garden of paradise. It was sin that introduced pain and death, thorns and thistles into this garden. Through sin, the world was plunged back into disorder and chaos. But God had a plan. The gardener himself would enter into our fallen world to restore the beauty and dignity of his wayward sons and daughters. Hello everyone, my name is Father John Burns and I'm gonna be unpacking a little bit of the scripture with you today on the theme of creation. The thing I wanna point out especially for consideration, really for prayer, is that the setting in which God chooses to begin everything is a garden. The first setting, the locus, where the whole story of our existence started was the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, there was a harmony before the fall. There was a balance, there was a communion. The scripture tells us that man and woman were naked and, and without shame. And that's more than just a word about their bodies, it's a word about their spirits, their hearts, their minds. That, there was nothing between them, nothing dividing them, and so no experience of the disharmony of what would come later. So this, this original setting, this locus of communion, of self-disclosure where man and woman come to know God and come to know each other, and there's no division, there's a harmony, a communion, and a balance. That reality is written into our bones. It's why down to today, things that are organized or ordered sort of bring a peace or a contentment to us and things that are not do the opposite. Just think about like your house or your apartment or your office, even your desk. When things are chaotic, when things aren't organized, when they're out of order, when there's a disorder or a disarray, we kind of feel that. We, we sense this certain restlessness, this dis-ease that comes from disorder. And that is a sign of and a fruit of 
what comes next in our story, which is the fall. That as soon as disobedience enters the equation, as soon as man and woman break their will from the Father's will, this rupture, this first disharmonious note is sung into the song of creation, and the rest of the story is less about the garden and more about the wilderness. That man and woman hide themselves, right? They cover their bodies, they hide from God. Eventually they're clothed in the skins of animals and they're cast out into the space outside of the garden, which is not harmonious and organized and balanced. It's the wilderness, the garden's opposite. And so we see even in our early parts of the story, this longing for the garden and this desire to return to, to the harmonious relationship, the right balance that we once had where, where shame need be no more. Christ entering into the scene undoes what happened when the first man and the first woman turned away. That Christ obeys where Adam disobeyed. And wonderfully, if you look closely in the scriptures, it's John's gospel especially, the obedience of Jesus Christ occurs in a garden to undo the disobedience of the first man, Adam, which occurred in a garden. That that first disobedience closed off the garden and we were stuck wandering and sad. And so Christ enters the scene, the, the logic of God opening a way into something that had been closed because of our disobedience. In John's gospel, it says that that night he went out to a garden and in a garden, he knelt to the ground and he sweat these tears or these, these, these uh, droplets of sweat that seemed to be blood. They fell upon the cursed earth. He took the fruits of the curse, the thorns promised to Adam in Genesis three, and he places them upon his own head willfully to signify his power to break the curse, to restore the possibility of living in perfect obedience to the Father. And then as he dies upon the tree of life, Adam having taken from a tree, Christ mounts the tree to, to bring victory where there was failure. He falls into what the scripture tells us is a tomb in the garden in which none had ever been laid, a, a virgin tomb, the womb of the earth, the seed that, that fell into the ground and died. The magnificence of the story picks up on that great Easter morning when Mary Magdalene goes out to the tomb to search out Jesus. And as she arrives at the tomb, of course, we know how the story goes. She finds an empty tomb and she finds the two angels sitting there and she's searching for his body. And having addressed them, the, the scripture tells us this, that having said this, Mary turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, and hearing her name pronounced by the King of Kings, she knows herself and she knows it's Jesus. But something that I've been sitting with for quite some time is the fact that Mary Magdalene has a special way of recognizing Christ that, that she's been restored by his intervention in her life. The scripture told us earlier that she was possessed by seven demons. Her heart was like a wilderness, a, a chaotic place filled with evil. And, and in encountering Christ, the, the heart is restored and the demons cast out. And so her ability to recognize her affinity for the work of God and the logic that he brings would, would be very high. And so I'm convinced actually that in that morning, she doesn't quite make the mistake we presume that while she mistakes him to be a gardener, it's actually just a mistake of person. In other words, she doesn't recognize that it's Jesus, but I believe she's correct, in fact, in seeing him to be the gardener. We might even argue that he wanted her to see him as the gardener, because in fact, that's exactly who he is. That Christ's work here is to restore a garden, to establish not the old Garden of Eden, which was closed and remains closed, but rather to, in a new covenant, establish across the face of the earth a new garden to make a church born from his side that would, would create for all of us the possibility to return to something that we once knew and that still cries out from our bones. So friends, I just hope that maybe you can pray with this reality of the garden as a profoundly biblical thematic and see Christ as the one who comes to restore a garden on the face of the earth, in the church, but also in our hearts. Because there's an awful lot of wilderness that creeps in and that can be disheartening but the gift of God shown to us in the word is that his, his ordering presence brings about what's meant to be there, that he wants to restore us to that place, that setting, that reality of being in right relationship where harmony reigns and peace is our friend.
So friends, I hope this blesses you. There's so much more to discuss, and that is to the Holy Spirit, to your interior lives, and the great gift of this journey that we share here on earth. God bless you all. The story of creation recounts both artistry and tragedy. The man and the woman, Adam and Eve, are given everything from a loving father. But instead of trusting and obeying the father's voice, they choose to follow the deceiver. Because of this choice, all their precious relationships are disrupted with each other, with God, and with creation. Their sin introduces disorder into their own hearts and bodies, and so they pass on to their descendants a legacy of brokenness which we call original sin. Andrew, the creed doesn't really include the fall per se, but it presumes it because before people profess the creed in baptism, they'd have to turn west in the direction of darkness and say, and they were asked three things. Do you renounce Satan? I do. I do. And all his works? I do. I do. And all his empty promises? I do. So at the beginning of Genesis, we find out that the whole reason we need redemption is because at the very beginning, people fell. Yeah. Our first parents fell into believing those empty promises yes. and cooperating with those damaging, destructive works. You kind of have to know the bad news. Uh, at least take it seriously before you can really appreciate how good the good news really is. I think and we know this in our bones, that sin is not merely an intellectual problem. I mean, how many of us have had this experience where you, 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 your reason says one thing, but your passions, your emotions, your desires say another. Right. And at that moment, we've got two options. We can try to realign our desires and passions with right reason, or we can, as we so often do, cook up some good reasons to justify doing right. what we want to do. It's called rationalization. And this is the legacy of the fall. This is the legacy of sin and original sin, where from our first parents, we've received a fallen nature. God created us good, but that goodness has been corrupted, and our, our intellects are darkened, our wills are weakened, uh, and we've got this legacy of sin that we all yeah. know so well. That the apple had some poison in it. It was like, the, you know, a poisoned apple. And it hasn't and it fallen a, that far from the tree. Has it? That's right, <laughs> and, and there was a hook in it. And, and so sin enslaved our human family, right. our first parents, and that, that, is, that slavery and that tendency towards self-destructive yes. things. I love the catechism in 397. It says that original sin was a, we lost trust in the goodness of God, right. the creator, because we're all thirsting for happiness. And you think about our parents, you know, if you really believe that your parents wanted nothing more than for you to be happy, and you believe that they knew exactly what would make you happy, would you ever disobey? And it's just probably still yes, but it would be irrational to do so. It's irrational, it's dumb, right. and it's also proud. It's like, yeah. I know better than yeah. God. Right. And instead yeah. of listening to my loving father, it's kind of dumb. And sin makes you stupid. <laughs> you know? Sin makes you stupid and makes you sad. It really does. And it, it, you see the sadness. What's the result of original sin? Immediately, man and woman, their relationship is disrupted. They're alienated from each other. Then they're alienated from God. And then their kids, one kills the other. It's just a spiral, right, a right. snowball of alienation yeah. and tragedy and right. separation that you know hits the wall with the, with the Tower of Babel. Everyone's scattered. Right can't understand each other. So Genesis is really profoundly yeah. uh, insightful and powerful, inspired by God as teaching us where our problems come from right. and that we really can't save ourselves because right. we've, inha we've received this tendency and this is part of what original yeah. sin is about. Yeah, sin is not an intellectual problem. It, it's like, yeah, we, we're kind of connected. We come into this, this world connected by an umbilical cord. We don't just come up here out of nowhere. Right. So uh, the choices of our parents and our ancestors impact yeah. Us. They right. stack the deck. We begin with uh, this problem, with this right. tendency and attraction right. towards what's self-destructive. And so we need a savior. We need a new Adam to redo this whole thing right and a new Eve. Yeah. And that's what we have in Jesus yeah. and his mother Mary. Blessed mother. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you, you mentioned uh, Adam and Eve and, and this kind of disintegration. I mean, you know, Adam and Eve were naked without shame, this original unity. After the fall, you see shame, lust, domination. That's not what we're made for. And, and, and as you say, we have a new Adam who has righted the wrong and a new Eve and Mary are, are, are the new mother of all the living. And what we need is not just teaching. What Jesus right. gives us is not just teaching. He gives us the gift of his spirit. Because as we said, sin is not an intellectual problem. You might know what to do or what not to do. That doesn't give you the power to live this out. The gift of the spirit and the Holy Spirit, this is what empowers us that answers to the human condition and helps us to live not just a fully human life, but a supernatural life. The Spirit comes to heal the wounds of sin and to liberate. 
The story of Adam and Eve leads up to the second and most central stanza of the Creed, the story of the new Adam and the new Eve. A Redeemer will come to heal the wounds of sin and division, reconcile us with God and one another, and begin a new creation. This will be the story told in the next session of our study. At the center of both the Nicene and Apostles' Creed lies the very heart of the Catholic faith, the proclamation of salvation in the person and mission of Jesus Christ. This session of our study, filmed in a special church dedicated to the Redeemer, will consider the second stanza of our creed, which is all about Jesus and what he did to save us. I remember the first time I walked into this church, I think my jaw hit the ground. One of my favorite things to do is to turn around and watch people walk in behind me and their first look at this place is just stunning. Um, the Italians know it as the Jesu or the Church of the Holy Name of Jesus. And it's the mother church of the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus. And one of your favorite saints is definitely right behind us. That's right, St. Ignatius of Loyola is buried right over there. And you know, he's just such a hero of mine for a number of reasons. He was born in 1491, mm -hmm. um, and he was really just driven by an intense desire for military fame, he wanted to be the guy, you know, and they say that he was a fancy dresser and a real womanizer. So you could say, this was the frat boy before there were frat boys, right. right? But then it just kind of blew up in his face at one point in a battle in 1521, he just damaged his leg, gravely injured his leg and had to have surgery uh, and just laid up and his whole world is rocked yeah. and reading the life of Christ, the lives of the saints. All of a sudden, his life took a completely different turn. And as you said, he founded the Society of Jesus. He just changed his life completely, but he had to hit rock bottom first. And in my own conversion story, I grew up Catholic, but it didn't, it didn't mean much to mm, me. And I yeah. uh, really lived for football image, things like that. And I remember in May of my freshman year in college, uh, our team played an exhibition game in Paris, France. And wow. at the time, I didn't even want to go. I wanted to get home to train and, and gun for a starting spot. And, so there I am in Paris, France in the game, and all of a sudden my legs go out from beneath me in more ways than one. Uh, I broke my leg over there in, in, in Paris, France, and my world is just crushed. I mean, everything that makes me me is gone. And you know, one thing leads to another, and hitting that rock bottom, I found Jesus, and I never lost my killer instinct. I kept playing football, but all of a sudden, the game of life, the spiritual life, the moral life, the intellectual life, that's, that's what I wanted more than anything yeah. and fought in that way, the way I used to train. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. That is so awesome. You know. I, I really am amazed at how often both Catholics and non-Catholics act like Jesus is the Christian thing and the Catholic stuff is all the other stuff, <laughs> Every, all the statues and, yeah. the, and the rosaries. And the, and, and the point is, really, Jesus is the center and heart of it all. Right. The creed is the heart of our faith yep. and the heart of the creed is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Christ. Why are the sacraments important? Because he instituted them and he comes to us through them. Mm -hmm. Why is Mary important? Because it's his mother. <laughs> Why can we call God Father? Because he let us in on that. He shared his Father with us and then he shared his Spirit with us. So everything is centered in him and everything in Catholic life holds together and finds its meaning in him. The mystery boggles the mind that the infinite, unseen God would lower himself to enter into this finite world, become one of us, sharing completely in our humanity. This is called the Incarnation, the divine word becoming flesh in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. This is the first mystery we ponder when we recite the Creed's second stanza. This chapel of the Jesu is dedicated to Mary. And obviously, without Mary, we wouldn't have had Jesus because Jesus is not just God and he's not just man. He's true God and true man. And that's what the creed teaches us. We talk about the incarnation and it's really important to understand Jesus did not just take a body. Jesus took a whole human nature. God gave him a human soul, 
the human body, everything that it means to be human. He thought with a human mind. He worked with human hands, the Second Vatican Council says. So it's really important to get this. And why did he come? Why did he become man? For us men and for our salvation, right? And our salvation actually begins in the womb of Mary because sin alienated man and God, humanity and divinity. We were separated. There's a gulf. And in the womb of Mary, we have the reconciliation of humanity and divinity, perfect union. And all that remained was for all of us to be drawn into that perfect union. And Jesus won the right to bring us all into that union with God in what he did on the cross. Amen. This, our, the central mystery of our faith is just so breathtaking. And I think about the humility of God. Yeah. I mean, if, if I were God, and thank God I'm not, right? <laughs> and I became man. I mean, I would be Caesar Augustus. I would be so, right? But here, the God-man born in a manger in Bethlehem, the humility of God, his self emptying As you say, he's true God and true man. Uh, he reconciles heaven and earth. He is the bridge because he's fully man and fully God. You know, 1 Timothy 2.5 says, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, because he's fully human. St. Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, something to be grasped at, but emptied himself, take on the form of a slave, uh, to the point of death, even death on the cross, therefore God highly exalted him. But there's this movement in the entire Christian story that uh, the, the fathers used to say, the catabasis and the nabasis, the, the coming down that God unites himself with us fully to raise us up to him. And you know, in the early centuries, there were a series of heresies, some that denied his right. humanity. They said, there's no way God could get intermingled with flesh and really be human. It must only be a facade. It must only appear that way. And then there are others that said, no, no, he cannot be fully God. And the Father said very clearly, that is not the apostolic right. faith. He is true God and true man. And there are even more that said, well, because of that, Mary can't be mother of God. She's not the cause of his right. divinity. Right. But we see here that Mary, and thinking correctly about Mary, is directly tied to thinking correctly about Jesus and who he is. Absolutely. The Council of Ephesus defines that Mary truly is the God-bearer. Theotokos, the mother of God. Because if you deny that, you're denying that Christ is truly God. It's really, really simple. So like you, how can you, in the Old Testament, just imagine the honor that was paid to the Ark of the Covenant. And that contained, that was understood as the glory seat, you know, the, the Lord is seated upon, you know, the Ark. And in the Ark contained just the Ten Commandments, kind of relics of God's action. Well, Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant. She contained not just the Ten Commandment tablet, she contained God himself, the, the word living made flesh. Word made flesh. So really, how much more honor should we pay to the Ark of the New Covenant, Mary, than Jews paid to the Ark of the Old Covenant? For sure. And Mary, of course, she's not the cause of his divinity, but she gives birth not to a nature, but to a person. And the person to whom she gave, gives birth is the person of God the Son. That's why we say that Mary is mother of God, because it helps to preserve the unity of who Jesus is as the one divine person who has fully assumed a human nature. You know, what I love about this, and as many thinkers in our tradition have said, you know, Jesus came to us through Mary, and so it's right. fitting to go back to him through Mary and you know, the, the Hail Mary is really a very biblical prayer. It's right there in Luke 1, uh, from the words from Gabriel, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And then Elizabeth's words of the visitation, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Uh, and as St. John Paul II once said, taking those two together, Gabriel's words and Elizabeth's words really are giving us heaven's vantage point, in Gabriel, right. and Earth's vantage point in Elizabeth, of the incarnation, the wonder of the incarnation. They're both, ah, this is how heaven and earth just is in awe at the incarnation uh, because this is the center of it all. And even the Hail Mary, the Hail Mary, if you think about it closely, the name of Jesus is the center of gravity of that prayer. We really, when we pray the Hail Mary, it should almost be like a speed bump right before the name of uh, Jesus right. and a speed bump right after the name of Jesus so that we really see the Christocentric anchor of this Marian prayer. You know, another thing, a lot of times people have problems with Catholic devotion to Mary. And what we're talking about now is the fact that that all is about the centrality of the incarnation, who Jesus is. But the same thing is true about another dimension of Catholic spirituality and prayer. These churches are filled with images. And there are some people who are really uncomfortable with images because in the Old Testament, God said, don't 
make images. Well, amazingly, God himself gave us, finally, the true image. All the old images that he prohibited now have been really superseded by the true image. Jesus is the image or the icon. That's a word that's used in Greek, of the unseen God. That's what Colossians 1 says. So in the early church, when there was a battle over the use of icons, this was their argument, the argument of the fathers, of the councils, is that if God gave us an image and part of humanity is able to depict someone in art, then for us to deny the use of images is to deny the incarnation of Jesus. So how about the images of all the saints and Mary? They're all members of his body. So when we honor these images, the honor passes through the people they depict to the one who is the head of the body, responsible for the fruit of holiness in their lives. This makes me think of the transfiguration. So there, Moses and Elijah appear on Mount Tabor. They see Jesus transfigured in glory. You know, Moses and Elijah, they both had experiences with God in this life. They both had theophanies where God revealed himself to them. Uh, Moses got to see God's back, but not his face. And Elijah got to see the Lord in a still small whisper, in a still small voice. But there on the Mount of Transfiguration, with Jesus transfigured in glory, there Moses and Elijah see what they could not see in their earthly lives. They see in Jesus Christ transfigured in glory, the very face of God. God entered this world through the portal of a mother's womb. Mary, whose role is honored in the second stanza of the Creed, conceived him first in her heart through faith and then in her womb by the Holy Spirit. Hi, my name is Jackie Francois Angel, and today we're gonna talk about Mary the Theotokos, Mary the mother of God. So my five-year-old, who's a very philosophical little girl, she actually told me one time that her head is has a box in it full of questions. So one day before bed, she asked this question. She said, did God create Mary? And I said, yes. And she said, but she's his mother. How could God create his mother? And I walked out of the room and I said, the Theotokos. <laughs> so, what, what a good question though, right? How could God create his own mother? Well, when Mary said yes, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, she said yes to the divine plan to become the mother of Jesus. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says this in paragraph 495, that called in the Gospels the mother of Jesus, Mary is acclaimed by Elizabeth at the prompting of the Spirit and even before the birth of her son as the mother of my Lord. In fact, the one whom she conceived as man by the Holy Spirit, who truly became her son according to the flesh, was none other than the Father's eternal Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity. Hence, the church confesses that Mary is truly mother of God, Theotokos. She is the mother of God. And in fact, I love that St. Irenaeus, this paragraph right before um, quoted in Lumen Gentium, says, as St. Irenaeus says, being obedient, Mary became the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. Hence, not a few of the early fathers gladly assert The knot of Eve's disobedience was untied by Mary's obedience. What the virgin Eve bound through her disbelief, Mary loosened by her faith. Comparing her with Eve, they call Mary the mother of the living and frequently claim death through Eve, life through Mary. So if Jesus is the new Adam, Mary is the new Eve. And she is truly our mother, the mother of the living. And in fact, when when Jesus from the cross gives his mother Mary to John. He in fact gives her for the whole church and for us. And and so she is not only the mother of me, but she's the mother of the entire church. And so I know in my own life, as I've grown in a relationship with Mary, I have absolutely come to see her as my mother. And I'm always asking her for her intercession, just as in the Old Testament time, you would petition, you would go to the mother of the king and she would make sure the petitions were known to him. And so we absolutely can ask Mary, our mother, to, to help us, to pray for us, for the, the graces of, of the son. And I know in my own life, it, her graces, the graces are so powerful. Um, and often we don't ask for the graces. In fact, there's a whole storehouse of graces people forget to ask for. So remember, she is 
your mother. She is my mother. Before I go and speak on a stage, I ask Mary to be with me and to pray for me. And I, I imagine that she takes her mantle, like her, her blue mantle, and like Our Lady of Guadalupe mantle with the stars and wraps it around me to protect me from the evil one. And I ask for her to pray for all the people who are listening, all the young people, the elderly people, whoever is in the audience, to for God's graces to be in their hearts. And what's amazing is that multiple times, I've had people come up to me, te- some were teenagers, and twice one teenager said, I saw Mary next to you. Another time someone said, Jackie, I saw blue around you. And I'm like, Mary, that's you. <laughs> and then another time uh, teenagers were like, we smelled roses. And I'm like, Mary, you are with me because you are my mother and you care for me. And so I tell my children too, Mary is your mother and she loves you and she wraps you in her love and she wants the best for you just like a mother does. And, and so I'm so glad that Jesus has given us Mary as his mother and that she is truly the Theotokos. She's not only mother of the church, she's, she's mother to every, each and every one of us. So ask for her intercession. She will be there. She will pray for you. And her prayers are powerful. It says in James 5.16, it says the prayers of a righteous person are powerful. And she who is without sin is a righteous person and she is with Jesus in heaven. And she will pray for you. So I hope you fall in love with your mother as I have. God became man in order to save us. And this rescue mission could not be carried out without unimaginable suffering. The horror of the cross was the only way to the glory of the resurrection. We ponder the suffering love of Christ in the church in Rome most especially dedicated to the memory of his sacred passion. There are many holy places in Rome, but few are at the level of where we're at right now, which is at Santa Croce. Uh, In this place, it's one of the holiest sites and the fact that there are so many items and relics from Jerusalem, from our Lord's passion. It's just unbelievable to think that there's a nail from the crucifixion There's thorns from his crown of thorns. There's pieces of the real cross, the true cross, you know, just sitting right behind us. The fact that Thomas's finger that went into the side of our Lord, um, it's just unbelievable to think that the good thief, part of his cross is hanging back there. And even the charge that was written above our Lord sits in this very place. And we could probably spend a good eight to 10 hours just doing this one session on suffering and death not only talking about our Lord's suffering and death, but talking about our own and what is the meaning of all of this? Why, why do good people suffer? Why does there have to be death? We could go on and on, but isn't it true that no one even likes to talk about suffering and death? Most people avoid it at all costs. They don't wanna think about it. They don't wanna deal with it, um, but it's very real. And I think that, especially during the pandemic, it was very easy uh, to come face to face with that suffering and that death and watching loved ones suffer and die, but also no one knows the hour, no one knows the day. Like we all know we're going to die, but how are we going to handle that and what kind of suffering is gonna come our way in our lives? Um, we had a friend during the pandemic that was having a conversation with you know, another person and uh, he said, what could be worse than death? And she looked at him and said, death without faith. And that really, that really struck me. And um, it's, it's hard to talk about, yes, but we have to be real about the fact that there is suffering and we are gonna die. One of my favorite things was reading about the monks that do the exercise of a happy death. I had never heard of it before, and when I was reading about it, I was reading about these monks who once a month, they have a day that they call it the exercise of a happy death. And in that day, they spend the whole day preparing to die, like they would die the next day. So if they have a grievance with another monk, they go and they talk to him about it. If they need to ask for forgiveness or forgive someone, they go to confession, they go to mass, and they go to bed that night really and truly prepared to die. And it struck me because we might not do that, but it's like, I need to. Yeah, the mortality rate is 100%. Uh, <laughs> right. And you're right, the pandemic brought that to our, uh, the forefront. You know, when you think about the mystery of evil and suffering and how does this fit in the Christian life and how does this fit with a loving God and fit with the gospel? Right. I think the first thing to say is Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He's God with us as our head before us on the cross, but he's God with us in our suffering right right Absolutely. now. And a couple of ways to maybe think about this is uh, you think our lives are kind of like a paragraph of an entire book. Right. 
And if you just found a paragraph by itself, cut away from the entire book, you don't really know the full meaning, the full breadth of what that paragraph is all about. And, exactly. and there's things in this life that aren't going to make full sense. They, they're not right. going to be fully comprehensible uh, until we see it from God's point of view, from God's perspective on the other side of heaven. You know, St. John Paul II wrote a letter on suffering, the salvific meaning of suffering in 1984. And this is just a few years after he was shot in 81. Right, right. And he talked about a twofold gospel of suffering, which is kind of a, a turn of phrase. What do you mean gospel of suffering? Right. And he said, well, on the one hand, the good Samaritan, the suffering in others draws out a greater love in us mm. as we seek to tend to their needs. But secondly, the mystery of redemptive suffering. And we kind of pay lip service to that, but here's the key is, is Jesus on the cross. The cross is a revelation of the love of God. Jesus didn't suffer so we wouldn't have to. He went as our head to empower us to do the same through his spirit so that our suffering could also be redemptive. And so the classic passage is in St. Paul, Colossians 1, 24, among others, uh, which says, where St. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings because in my sufferings, I make up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Hmm. And it's like, well, what, what could possibly be lacking in right. Christ's afflictions? I right. mean, nothing. Cro his cross is super abundant. Yeah. What's lacking, what's left, is for the mystery of the cross and resurrection to be reproduced in each and every one of us. And, and this is really, this is the essence of Christianity. It's for the Paschal mystery, his life, death, and resurrection to be reproduced, recapitulated in and through each one of us that begins in our baptism. We enter into his death and we share right now in his resurrection. And that's what's new with Christian death. What's new with Christian death, as the catechism puts it, is the Christian has already died with Christ in baptism. Right, in baptism. Has already died with Christ right. in baptism. And so on the one hand, we should seek healing. Absolutely. Whether it's medical help, whether it's prayer for healing, absolutely. But we all know there are some suffering that the Lord does not will to remove from us at this very moment. Right. And when that happens, we just need to offer that up in union with the cross as a holy gift and sacrifice back to the Father yes. and enter into the mystery of the cross and believe firmly that that act is redemptive in the Lord's eyes. What graces will be poured out because. because we do that? And this means we have a mission to the very end of our life, our dying breath. We always have a mission. Our life is never in the rearview mirror. Right now, right here, at every moment, to the very end, we have a mission to cooperate with Christ's saving work and to enter into his death on the cross and his resurrection. The cross alone would not have saved us. It was Christ's entire Passover, from death to glory at God's right hand, that set us free. The resurrection and ascension are essential for our salvation. Andrew, you're right. In baptism, we're plunged into Christ's death and resurrection. We share both. And I think it's really important to say here, as in this wonderful place that's dedicated to the cross, that though the cross is so central, Christ sacrifices death, that without the resurrection, St. Paul says, we're still in our sins. On our sins. So it's our, the cross, resurrection, and ascension as one entire work of Christ that's seamless, like the seamless robe. The church calls that the Paschal mystery. That's what Jesus was talking about in the Transfiguration, according to Luke. He was talking about his exodus, his passing over. Right. So it's like one thing. You can't really separate the three. No, no, you can't. And there's a real danger in, in just focusing on the cross as if that's the end of redemption, the end of, of salvation, because it's not. As you said, the resurrection is key. Uh, I love the catechism. It puts it very well in Catechism 654, where it says there's two aspects to the Paschal mystery. By his death, he atones and liberates us from sin, but by his resurrection, he infuses us with divine life. And think about this. Think about this mystery for a second. Jesus right now, right now, exists in his glorified and risen humanity. Yes. The incarnation wasn't something like a coat he put on that he just ripped off. Right. Rather, no, he died our death, he rose to new life, and he right now is in his glorified and risen humanity, not just for his sake, but for our sake, so that we yes. may share in that reality as well. And it's important to realize he didn't just come back to life. Right. It wasn't a resuscitation like Lazarus, where you know, Lazarus had to die again. No, Jesus passed over into a, a brand new right. human existence that the world has never seen right. before. Right. And we're going to share that. We share, with, we share that now through the power of the Spirit. Yeah. So the power of his resurrection is, is still is right now here with us. But we're going to fully experience that with a regeneration of our bodies. You know, we're not just going to be angels forever right. as souls. We will have 
bodies. The resurrection of the dead is the end of the creed, and that is the end of our faith. We say, I believe in the resurrection of the body, right? I mean, what happened to the head, as St. Augustine used to say, uh, will happen to the body. And so yes. we, we, we think that we make a, just a huge mistake, as you said, when we think that eternal life is just this disembodied bliss. No, no, no. The body is good, and Christ redeemed not just our souls, but our bodies, and we will share in that resurrection as well. The, the, the fathers of the church call the Eucharist the medicine of immortality. immortality. So in receiving the Eucharist, and by the way, in every Mass, it's not just Calvary that's made present. We're at the foot of the crossbar, also outside the empty tomb. The power of the resurrection is made present in every Mass. And that's why we celebrate Mass, especially on Sunday, because Sunday's the day of the resurrection. It's the eighth day, the eternal day, the <clears throat> first and the last, no ending yeah. and no beginning. And that's why Easter is the number one feast. Yes. So when we receive the Eucharist, we're receiving the risen body of Christ in order to transform and sanctify not only our souls, but our bodies. And every time we receive the Blessed Sacrament, it's that's Jesus right. risen in glory. Yeah. And by receiving his risen body, we too have hope of our own resurrection. We should be thinking about that every time we receive, that this is... Jesus risen in glory. We're walking into heaven itself. It's a pledge, foretaste of what's to come. The creed proclaims that Christ, risen from the dead and ascended to God's right hand, will return as the judge. This world as we know it will come to an end. All will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The second stanza of the creed after the ascension, it says, and he will come in glory to judge the living and the dead. So should we be worried about this? Well, maybe anyway? I should be. You, you'll be okay to mercy them. <laughs> you know, judgment, uh, we need to think of it this way. Christ coming in judgment is going to reveal and illumine the truth that's already there. Uh, as C.S. Lewis once said of, uh, of hell, he said, there's, there's two kinds of people. There's those who say to God, thy will be done. And there's those to whom God says, thy will be done. God doesn't send anybody to hell. It's a choice that we make here. And what the Lord is going to do, in effect, is ratify the choices we've already made here. He comes to ju in judgment to reveal and illumine the truth that's already there, the truth that right. we've chosen. And that's what he says in John 3 when he's talking to Nicodemus. He says, the judgment is this, that the light came into the world and people preferred darkness to light. Now, one of the things that's important, I think, is that he makes very, very clear what's not important and as a distraction is to try to figure out when he's coming, right? Indeed. But what is important is to be ready all the time. So if it's about choosing the light, that's a daily choice we need to make. It's and that's why the, the Christian life is not a one-time accepting Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior or being baptized. It's, it's about daily conversion. It's a whole lifestyle of continuous conversion, a journey of conversion toward the light. Just like marriage. Right? Yeah. Marriage is not a one-time decision. Right. Marriage is again and again choosing right. to love your spouse and choosing to love Jesus in your spouse. Yes. And you know, a lot of spiritual writers speak of a spiritual law of gravity. That, it, that if I've spent my life in the darkness, I'm not gonna yearn for the light when it comes. In fact, I'll yeah. probably flee from it. Right. I'll probably flee from it. So if we're living in the light, on a daily, a daily way, daily conversion, we have nothing to fear. It's all about how are we living? Right? Right. Are we living with the end in mind? Are we living in a way that is, is befitting who we are and our destiny and, and, and the end to which we're called? Or are we you know, living a sign of contradiction and kind of falling short uh, of our very selves? Right? And you said a minute ago about yearning for the light, and I think that's an important point. Hope is a theological virtue. It's one of the three biggies, but it's the unsung hero of the theological virtues. Yeah. Okay, because people forget about it. Right. And it's not just a hope and intuition that I'm gonna go to heaven when I die. Right. Instead, it's really yearning right. for the coming of Jesus. The early Christians cried out, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. They were excited about it. And actually, we pray for his coming in the Our Father. At every Mass we say, Christ has, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. again. And it's the quintessential virtue of the wayfarer, the, the person who's begun the journey but it hasn't arrived yet. It should be the virtue worth talking about a lot. Especially since it's called an anchor. It anchors us now. It, it, it keeps us from making the, these things of this world ultimate. You know, it seems so ultimate, reading the news, watching television, you know, people's opinions now, what the government's doing now, what stars are thinking, what the fads are not. Right. That's all gonna disappear. That's not reality. Right. So hope really anchors us in reality, which is Christ 
and him coming in glory. Well, as they say, he who marries the spirit of the age soon finds himself a widow, right? Uh, your hope as an anchor is a beautiful, beautiful image, but we do need to think about death. There's yes. a deep Catholic tradition of thinking about the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, hell, and every time we go to sleep at night, every time we go to confession, we're really doing a dress rehearsal for that final judgment. Yes. And if we're doing that on a regular basis, we'll never have anything to fear, to kind of live with that, that frame of reference in mind that death will come and I need to choose the Lord, as you said, daily in the here and now. And I love what you said about hope, because hope is the virtue of the wayfarer. It's the virtue of the one who is on the road. Yes. We've started, but we're not there yet. As wayfarers, we are on a journey of continuous conversion. The journey is an arduous one. What force propels us forward in our journey? The Lord Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father so that he could pour out upon us the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the wind in our sails that drives us forward. And it's His empowering work that we will examine in the next session of our study.